All right, welcome back. I had to take a short break. So we were talking about the legislation that is going to cover this settlement procedure. It is called RESPA. We have mentioned it before. It's the real estate settlement procedure. And remember, settlement is a term for the closing. So what the RESPA intention is, is to provide the consumer with a more timely and an accurate cost of all of the money they're going to pay for the settlement, okay? So that, remember, I think I mentioned that abusive lending practices where years ago a lender may say, hey, it's one origination point and then it gets to the closing and now it's three and the lender says, well, what are you gonna do? You, you want the house, you gotta close. So RESPA was created to stop this. It will provide that consumer with the actual amount of money that they need to close the document or close the, the property. Now, <clears throat> maybe I should go back and mention that we all understand that there are fees associated with buying the property. If you're going to buy a property that is $100,000 and you agree you understand that you may end up spending 106000 to buy it because you have got fees that you have to pay. One of the saddest things as a parent, I remember one of my children, we were at McDonald's one day and he saw the sign that said a cheeseburger was 99 cents and he had saved a dollar. So he was said, can I go buy a cheeseburger? And he went up to the counter and he came back and he said, Daddy, I don't understand. Why was it a dollar four when they said it was 99 cents? And I had to explain to him that he did not have enough money and you're going hungry. No, <laughs> that's not what I said. I said, no, son, there are fees associated and they're called taxes. Very similar you buy this property, there are going to be fees that are associated with it. Well, how much are the fees? Good question. This is where RESPA comes in. To tell that client how much the fees are going to be. This is, in essence, allows the consumer now to shop different mortgage lenders, different title companies, because under federal law, they have to know how much it's going to spend to buy that $100,000 house. That's what RESPA is designed to do, is to explain to that buyer, yes, you agreed to buy the property for $100,000 but you're actually going to need $107,814 to close it because of all of these associated fees that come with the closing. Now, it's not in your notes right here. It's probably in your book, but I wanna go back and talk about three. I wanna go back and, no, don't know what happened there talk about three sections that are in RESPA. There is this thing called Section 8 of RESPA that disallows kickbacks to another professional. So in other words, when you take your buyer client to your mortgage broker friend and say, hey, this guy needs a loan, that mortgage broker cannot give you a referral fee for bringing him. He can't pay you a kickback. And you guys can try and call this anything you want. There have been plenty of lawsuits. You can call it a professional services fee. You can call it a finder's fee, a splitting fee, whatever. It doesn't matter. You cannot pay for that lead to that professional. That is a violation of Section 8 of RESPA no kickbacks. Section nine says that one side or the other cannot force the other side 
to pay for a service that the original side chose. You see this happen when the seller says, I have already started the title work with Chicago title and the buyer says, I don't like them. I want to choose security title. Under section nine, they have the right to choose because the seller cannot force the buyer to use a company that the buyer has to pay for. There's the kicker in this whole deal, this word right here. Now, if the seller says, hey, Mr. Buyer, I'm paying your title insurance policy. Remember, there were two halves. There's the owner's half and the lender's half. And I told you the owner's half is paid for by the seller traditionally, and the lender's half is paid for by the buyer. This is what I'm talking about. However, if the seller says, I am paying for the owner's policy and I am going to pay for the lender's policy, then they can pick it because section nine says you cannot force them to pay for a service that they don't get to choose. If they're not paying for it, section nine doesn't apply. Section 10 of RESPA says that the lender can only take a specified amount to start those escrow accounts for the real estate taxes and for the homeowner's insurance. Remember, we touched on the pity payment and I told you that is called escrowed and the bank is holding your money for you. Every month you make a house payment but part of it goes into an escrow account for the real estate taxes, and part of it goes into an escrow account for the homeowner's insurance. And potentially there could be another one if you are required to have flood insurance, you may have a third escrow for flood insurance. Well, as you know, you cannot open a bank account without any money. You've gotta have some money to open that escrow account. Well, the lender will take some money from the borrower at closing to initially open, and the word they use is seed, S-E-E-D, to seed that account because they have to open the escrow with something. And that something is taken from the buyer at the closing table. Section 10 says that there is a specific amount that they can take. They can't take more than that. Imagine if a lender said, oh, uh, we don't know how much your insurance is gonna be, so we're just gonna take $10,000. That's what section 10 is there for. There is a specific number. We are not going to go through the calculation or the formula to determine that. You don't really need to know it. All you need to know is section 10 limits the amount of money that can be taken from the borrower to seed, initially open those escrow accounts. So those are the three big sections of RESPA that we need to be aware of. All right, section eight, no kickbacks. Section nine, can't force someone to pay for a service they didn't choose. And section 10, limits the amount of escrow that the lender can open the account with. Now, RESPA applies to all of these different types of loans. All right, any federally related first lien mortgage. So FHA insured, VA guaranteed anything made by a chartered lending institution like Fifth Third Bank or Chase or a credit union, anything like that, RESPA covers. So things RESPA does not cover are things that are what I would call special, like large properties, more than 25 acres, ag loans, construction loans, vacant land. Now, when I say vacant land, I mean 
land that is designed to be vacant, like hunting land or, or farmland or, you know, uh, fishing land or uh, timber. Vacant land does not include like the vacant lot because there is supposed to be a house placed on it. So vacant land, I mean like farmland or uh, timberland. Um, installment contracts. Remember, we talked about owner financing. And the assumption of a loan, we talked about assuming loans. So RESPA does not cover those. I can almost guarantee you there's a couple questions on the exam about which one RESPA does not cover. All right. There are things that RESPA necessarily doesn't really like, but they don't outlaw it. All right. So this thing called an ABA, an affiliated business arrangement. Okay. This is where a person may have a ownership interest in one company and a second ownership interest in another company and the consumer is using both companies for the closing. I am a prime example of this. I own a real estate brokerage company. I also own a mortgage brokerage company. If my buyer client is using one of my agents and they use my mortgage brokerage to get their loan through, they would be required to sign an ABA saying, hey, you understand that Raymond is going to make money off of you as a broker in the real estate world, and he's going to make money off you uh, through a commission in the mortgage world. And the client must agree to this in advance in writing. That sounds very similar to what? It sounds very similar to dual agency, right? I'm going to make money in the listing agent and the selling agent, and both clients have to understand. It's kind of different, but it's very similar. If my buyer says, hey, I want to use you, and I'm going to get my loan through you, and they agree to it, and they sign the ABA, then that's fine. I just have to let them know that it's happening. They are free to say no. I have actually had a client, one client tell me, no, I don't like that. And I'm like, okay, then which one do you want to seek other services elsewhere? And he said, well, I will go get my loan somewhere else. Okay. So that is called a con uh, an arranged business uh, agreement, ABA almost said control. That's, it used to be called the CBA and I have no idea they changed it now. There are other RESPA requirements. The most common one is this called the uh, transfer statement. If the lender that loaned money to the buyer, buyer is going to sell the note, Remember, we talked about those notes are sellable because they have value, hence the whole primary, secondary market thing. If that lender is going to sell the note, they must disclose that to the borrower. So the borrower knows it's going to be sold. Actually, the borrower knows it could be sold. Trust me, it probably will. The borrower cannot refuse this actual statement. The only refusal would be, I'm not borrowing money from you. So a lot of these terms that are in there require the borrower to agree. They can't go in and say, well, I want to change that to, to no, because the lender is going to say, no, that's our policy. That's what we do. You don't like our policy, then don't take our money. Go get your loan somewhere else. Okay. So what you have and what we have discussed are two federal laws that deal with the real estate world. 
The first one we had was called the truth and lending. Remember the trigger terms, regulation Z. And the second that we had, we just talked about, is this thing called RESPA, the Real Estate Settlement Procedure Act. So what the government did was take these two laws and push them together to make one new law that is called PRID. So what you have is the Truth in Lending Act, the Real Estate Settlement Procedure, and then they integrated them into a disclosure. So we have this acronym called TRID. Now I laugh <laughs> because TRID is an acronym of other acronyms, right? Because TILA, RESPA are acronyms. So technically the full name for TRID is the Truth in Lending Real Estate Settlement Procedure Integrated Disclosure. And we call it TRID. You guys will deal coming in in mostly in TRID because we it's the new rule. Since 2015, they've integrated them. So you do not have to worry about it. One of the things that TRID did was create now just two documents. There is one called the Loan Estimate Form. And the slang for that is called the LE, Loan Estimate. And the second form is the closing disclosure and the slang that you hear for that is the CD, all right? So these are now the only two forms that TRID uses, the loan estimate form and the closing disclosure form. Now, let's talk about each one of these. The loan estimate form is that form that the consumer must receive from their lender explaining all of the costs. Go back to what we said. That buyer is buying a $100,000 house, but he is going to spend $107,814 or whatever number I made up earlier. That buyer would get that number from this thing called the loan estimate form or the LE. And under federal regulation, that form must be given to the consumer within three business days after they make the application for the loan. I will guarantee that that is a test question. It is three business days, all right? So you must understand if the Guy makes a application on Friday, Monday, Tuesday. It must be received by the consumer within three business days after they made the loan application. The lender is the one that will put this out. And on this loan estimate form, he will have all of the fees that are going to be associated with closing. Now, I'm not sure what happened right here. I guess I got an extra space. <laughs> but the loan estimate form, once it has been submitted to the client, then that is what the fees are going to be. And he will put all of the fees on this form. Everything that constitutes that closing amount. So it would include, you know, the hundred grand, but then there's seven thousand eight hundred and fourteen dollars in closing costs, and that seven hundred eighteen, seven thousand eight hundred fourteen dollars is how much the consumer was going to spend to buy that hundred thousand dollar house. So in essence, the buyer is going to spend $107,814. 100 for the price of the house, 
And then this money that was on the loan estimate says this number. So the question is, where does this number come from? And this is what the lender will put together or the mortgage broker, depending on how you get. And that number is comprised of three types of numbers. All right. There are three types of numbers right here. There are three, they call them categories, three categories of numbers. The first category is a number that the lender or mortgage broker will quote that has zero tolerance. What does that mean? Means it cannot change. Zero tolerance. These are things that may not change before the closing. These are things the lender has control of like the interest rate. If the lender tells the borrower that I've locked you in on a loan at 5.5% interest, that's what the loan will be. It cannot change. It has zero tolerance. Okay. The second set of numbers are numbers that are called 10% tolerance. These are numbers that the lender doesn't necessarily control, but they have a good idea and they recommend using this person. So the lender may say, if you use Chicago title, your title insurance policy is going to be $500. Well, it could be 450 to 550. That is a 10% tolerance on that number. It is not their number, but they are suggesting that company to them. It is a recommended. Therefore, they can be within 10%. Here's the third number that just cracks me up. There is a third set of numbers that are allowed what's called an unlimited tolerance. These are numbers that the lender has no control of and probably doesn't even know who's providing the service. The most common one would be homeowner's insurance. All right. There are so many insurance companies out there that the, lend the lender or the mortgage broker really doesn't know who the buyer is going to use. Are they going to use the general? Are they going to use progressive? Are they going to use Lincoln Life? Are they going to use whomever? So the lender will put down a number like $400 a year. It could be theoretically $17,000. And that lender is not in trouble because there's an unlimited tolerance. Now, in the real world, what happens is that lender talks to the buyer and says, who are you using? And the buyer says, hey, my buddy over at Jefferson Life and, or Jefferson uh, Insurance. And that lender calls him and goes, hey, man, I need a ballpark for a three bedroom, two bath, 1500 square foot in that Miami Dade County property. And that <clears throat> insurance guy's going to go. Well, without an exact quote, but I'm going to tell you it's in the ballpark of 900. Then the lender will use that number because they want to be as close as possible, but they aren't required to be. And that's where this number comes from over here. Now, I think I erased it, so it's gone. Nope. That's where this number comes from. They will add these three numbers, which have zero tolerance, 10% tolerance, and an unlimited. This would be like the interest rate. This would be like a company they refer. I'm not going to use that word because I don't want you to confuse. This might be a company that's on their list of suggested companies. And this is one where they have no idea. This would be like a title company. This might be a homeowner's insurance company. And then they will add these numbers up. And that's where this number comes from. 
So you can see that even though they may have an unlimited tolerance right here, they want to be close because they want that number to be as acceptable to the consumer. Because with RESPA, I told you it allows consumers to shop. So what might happen is they may go to another mortgage broker and that other mortgage broker goes, well, dude, you're buying that $100,000 house and I think it's going to be 5790 to close because he had a better estimate of that unlimited tolerance. So the consumer may go, oh, I'll use that guy because it's cheaper. In this scenario here, it's only 105790 where this guy's 107814 So while they can have an unlimited tolerance, they typically love to try and get close. So this number is as competitive as it can be so that they don't lose the deal to another mortgage broker. The second document that gets collected or the second document that gets created is this thing called the closing disclosure. Now, for some reason, my timer's on the screen here. Let me see what's going on. Well, I guess we'll just deal with that timer. Um, let's move this up here so we can get away from it. The closing disclosure is the itemization of that number, all right? We talked about this number here, and that comes in the loan estimate form. The closing disclosure is actually the itemization of that list. Where does that 5,714 go to? You go to a credit, we pulled credit. You got title insurance, you've got courier fees, you've got recording fees. You've got because we can fees, all of that. And they that closing disclosure <clears throat> must be given to the borrower, once again, three business days before closing. So everybody gets a chance to look at it, including the lender themselves. So that closing disclosure has to be put together by the title company, they take that loan estimate and they put all those numbers in and get a final document, if you will, that will tell exactly where that money's going to, who's getting what, who's getting, and that is called the closing disclosure. And once it is completed, it will be then sent to the seller and the buyer and the lender for review and it has to be three days. So basically what I'm telling you is when that closing disclosure comes out, you cannot close for three days. And there, when this first started happening, I remember people in the industry were like, well, are there ways to get around it? Can I pull a favor? No, because this is a federal law. Everybody gets at least three business days to look at it. Okay, that is the closing disclosure. Now, the closing disclosure could change because of something the borrower does. For instance, if the interest rate has a significant change on the loan, we have seen this happen. We had a borrower who went through the entire process and was getting a 30-year fixed loan. About halfway through and about 10 days before closing, this young borrower came to us and said, hey, my dad said I should really have a 15-year loan to pay it off faster. I want to change my loan product. And that's what they call it. I want to go from a 15 to a 30-year, so I want to change the loan terms. That would require us to start all over again and give a new estimate three days and then create a new closing disclosure. And that would give everybody three days again to look for it. So it could change because of a significant change to a loan term. 
And one of the things they ask, I believe on the question, is if the APR has a greater change than one eighth, which is 0.125. If the interest rate changes more than an eighth, it could potentially be considered a significant change, which may trigger a new closing disclosure. And if that gets triggered to be a new one, then that three day time frame gets kicked back in again. Well, we gotta wait three more days again. All right.